Saturday, August 6, 2022, Kenston, North Carolina. There is a recreation of the CSS noose, and I'm going to go through it this morning. The only life-size replica of an ironclad Civil War vessel in the world, Kenston, North Carolina. Pretty big old rudder. You are about to board the only full-scale replica of a Civil War ironclad on Earth. Well, I bet this thing was hot back in the day on the Noose River. The Noose River is just over these trees here, right along there. Newburn is that way. Goldsboro is that way. Got a bell here. Hello. Hi, welcome aboard. Thank you, sir. Come on in. Welcome aboard the CSS News, the only full scale ironclad in the world. Uh, living, working, and uh, of course operating the CSS News. Yeah. How far did it ever go down the river? Uh, it went about past the Queens uh, Street Bridge uh, and it kept on going to about, it's uh, a little railroad bridge. It had a skirmish with some uh, ordnance rifles and uh, they fired on the bank for a little while. Uh, and then it eventually uh, came down the river just a little bit and they scuttled it. Uh, so it did have some engagement, but that's about as far as it went. So I'd say about a mile, mile and a half. Uh, it was launched in the spring of 64. Uh, and, well, I should say uh, usable in the spring of 64. So about from then to when it was scuttled on March 11th, 1865. Well, this, this helps. This gives you a chance to walk around inside of it and get a better sense of what those fragments over there mean. Yeah. Which is kind of why we're here. Now, when I was a kid, I remember it under the concrete shed because I grew up in Beulahville. Uh -huh. So, uh, but I haven't been over here in years and years and I didn't know it. the uh, hurricanes did the damage they did and it had been what was left of it moved to the museum. Yeah, they, they had to bring it inside. It was deteriorating too bad out in that Uh huh. And this is where the. I guess the captain would have been up here, right? Yeah, with his helmsman. It must have been fun with the gun lit off. Ooh. But, uh. Good grief, yeah. And then it was always pretty crowded. The uh, 
standard gun crew for this piece was 24 men and a powder boy. Wow. Which you can justify with the weight of the thing. Yeah. You know, the, the tube alone, I think, weighs about 9,000 pounds. And, and uh, it took two men, or four men on each side on that tackle just to run it out. Yeah. And then when the uh, gun was prepared, they would tighten these clamps on either side to the rail. And that would absorb the recoil. Okay. Uh-huh. Now, I saw a piece in the museum. Is it, was it a trunnion? This is called the trunnion. Oh, okay. This, this is the trunnion of the gun, and it, it sits in these, uh, with these caps on. Uh-huh. And, and it holds it to the... You're right, and then it can be, it can be run up and down. Oh, yeah, yeah. With the handle. This piece was uh, designed by a Confederate naval lieutenant named Brook. It's called the Brook Gun. Okay. And it was considered by both sides of the conflict to be the best naval piece produced during the war. It has the rifling. It has rifling, and it's cast iron in with the uh, uh, reinforcing of, of the breech with wrought iron band shrunk on, after the mariner of a parrot gun. But this is a lot heavier. It shoots a 90-pound solid projectile with up to 12 pounds of powder. Oh wow! Um, is that one? Is that one of the 90 pounders? That's a that's 84 pounds. That's okay. a, uh, an explosive shell. Okay. Uh, you can see wow. yeah. uh, where the fuse would go. Uh -huh. And then that's the powder bag. The, the powder boy would bring that uh, box up from below with, uh, with a charge in it. Okay. And it would go in in that bag. And then the uh, projectile down on top of it. Well, that's, that's very cool. I'm glad they got it this here piece of history. Well, it is interesting to see. I like it especially uh, for people who are, are interested but have never seen a full-sized ironclad. Yeah. Well, this is the only one on the planet, right? This is the only <laughs> one. Yeah. The uh, Yankees have got a, um, a full-scale model of the monitor, but it's not a walk around inside. It's just an external model. Where is it located? Uh, Portsmouth. Okay. Um, but you can't go in there. Uh-huh. This one, this one you can actually go in. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Now you're here by yourself, where you get it? Retrieval path. This photo was is dated February 2012. He was uh, okay, yeah, an archaeologist, and uh, this is this is not made from the original plan. This is made from the archaeological survey of the of the uh, wreck. Most, much of it before it came out of the river. But it, uh, to give you an idea, this ship uh, was one of two, actually it was one of three that were laid down. Uh, there was one on the Tar River, which was destroyed by a Union raid. Um, the news, which was almost destroyed by a Union raid, I think the uh, the Union had a target. They had a, a primary target, and they didn't quite know what they were looking at. And the uh, hull was defended more strongly than they liked, and so they just kind of blew it off and went on. Uh huh. 
They tried to set fire to it, but they didn't succeed in destroying it. Yes. And the Albemarle. Albemarle. The Albemarle was, was built to the exact same plan. The only difference is that they only pierced for three gun ports, four and a half, instead of five. Okay. I think they were in a hurry. They, uh, <laughs> When they first went into battle, they were still towing a barge with a blacksmith forge on it. <laughs> they weren't quite done yet, but here come the Yankees, let's go. Yeah. And as an as a, um, exemplar of the design, it was a complete success. Um, and presumably the news would have been too if they had been in a bigger river. Yeah. They ran in a ground down here very shortly, but it would have happened, I think, at yeah. some point. I mean, yeah. there's no time. And at the end, as Mace was describing to you, they were here in the river firing on the Yankees, but they couldn't go any farther because since since it, the first attempt, the river had been blocked with some obstructions and they couldn't uh, remove the obstructions in time to get any further down the river before the Yankees arrived. Yeah, it's got a pretty deep draft. I guess the water, how, the water would have come up where it changes angle out there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just at that knuckle, right? Yeah. So the only thing that was really sticking up was about that much deck and the casemate. Yep. Okay. And so it probably was dragging the bottom quite often. I wouldn't be surprised. The the, the design depth was seven feet, and uh, the. Uh, I think the effective depth, once loaded and ready, was nine, which is uh -huh. way too much. <laughs> uh, the uh, U.S. Navy were in New Bern, and they had a, a standing order that uh, nothing that drew more than eight feet was to proceed above New Bern on the river. Okay. Okay. You know, and I think that was probably... Had something to do with yeah, yeah. that, that was a good idea, and unfortunately the news was just too big. It was a terrific boat, though. Yeah. The uh, Albemarle went into battle for the first time. Um, they were designed to recapture Plymouth from the Yankees, just like the news was designed to uh, recapture New Bern. Okay, yeah, okay. But um, they went into battle against the Union gunboat fleet. The first Union <laughs> gunboat they came on was the USS Southfield, which had been converted from a civilian vessel and turned into a gunboat by the Navy. And they rammed it and sank it immediately. 25 of these things in the commission. What? Okay. Uh, the news and the Albemarle were here in the West Coast. The Raleigh and the North Carolina were in Wilmington. Um, and when you think about it, the purpose of this was to be a brown water navy. Okay. They never were, they never were seagoing. The people didn't even know how to live on it. It's too nasty. Yeah. Um, but. It was designed to be a quick, dirty solution to protecting the ports of uh -huh. the Confederacy, and it worked. Uh, Savannah had two. Savannah had to be taken from the land. Uh, Charleston had several, and the Union Navy tried twice to invade Charleston from the sea and were thrown back with heavy losses. Both times they lost one of their monitors doing that. Uh huh. And another ironclad. Yeah. I would imagine it probably. Well, this one might a little. It probably you could probably get one of these built in uh, close to a year, maybe. Or well, it depends on the, the big problem with them, and the problem that the news had particularly was the iron. Okay. Um, most of the iron was railroad rails. Now, in those days, railroad rails were made out of wrought iron. They were soft, and so they wore out quick. They got flat spots and kinks and stuff. Not like the steel rails we have today. Yep. Right. So there were piles of discarded railroad rails around. If you could get them to Richmond, which is the only place to do it, you could have them forged into bars. If you heat up a railroad rail and forge it into a rectangular bar, there's enough meat to make a two inch by seven inch bar. Okay. And that's what they did. You probably saw some in the museum. You yep. wondered why yep. they were that big. Yes. That's a flattened out railroad rail. Oh, wow, yeah. And so they would they spike on a layer horizontal, two inches thick, and over the top of that another layer vertical for four inches. Okay. And that was effective. The guy that designed that gun, Brooke, was also uh, the engineer who converted the Merrimack. Okay. And he took, he took lumber and iron and cannon out to the woods and he experimented with different combinations and layers and angles 
and this became pretty standard. It's 17 inches of pine, 4 inches of oak, and 4 inches of iron on top of that. And that was basically effective. It would stop anything yeah. that the Union Navy could reasonably bring to bear on it. Scale parrot got made by one of our supporters, actually the head of the amateur radio club. It's just like a locomotive boiler in a firebox. So crew's quarters back here. Wow. The crew's quarters formed the largest living space for the crew members when they were not on duty. The crew aboard the CSS Noose constructed bunk beds for sleeping, but evidence exists that some crew members may have slept in hammocks as well. The galley was where the boats, cooks, prepared meals for the crew. Sailors aboard the CSS Noose received government rations similar to those provided for the army in the field. Yeah, I smell burlap. Powder magazines. The gunpowder and powder bags were maintained in this magazine. This space was secured and bags with powder charges were passed from inside the magazine to a sailor outside this room. Those who worked in the powder magazine were not allowed to have any metallic objects on their uniforms, nor were they allowed to wear any clothing that could produce a spark. A spark would cause an explosion that would destroy the gunboat. Here's the ordinance room. Projectile room. Projectiles for the Brook rifles were maintained in this space. The guns fired four types of projectiles. One type was a solid 92 pound armor pistol one type was a solid 92 pound armor piercing bolt. The more typical projectiles were either 32, 32 pound brook, malane, or reed, or red exploding shells. In addition, the guns fired anti personnel canister and grape shot. A fragment of a brook shell was discovered 1.5 miles from the river, suggesting the range, the brook, the brook rifle could fire a 32 pound shell with a 20 pound black powder charge. This is the captain's cabin. This space served not only as the captain's private sleeping quarters, but also as a work space where he tackled many administrative tasks he faced. Civil War Generals. Jackson. Civil War Generals. There's Sherman that burnt Atlanta and much of Georgia. 
This compartment served as the sleeping quarters for officers. The officers probably spent little time on board, if not assigned to duties. When the boat was tied up, the officers lodged in a nearby house they rented. During the day, officers were engaged in all manner of work from drilling the gun crews to overseeing construction and maintenance. They would have had little time to spend in their quarters. The boiler room, a steam power plant consisting of a firebox, boiler, two engines, and propellers powered the CSS noose. The propulsion system used a type of boiler called a fire tube boiler. Coal or wood fed into the firebox created the heat to produce the steam that powered the engines. When the ship was underway, fueling the fire was hard, demanding work. The boiler room was one of the busiest and hottest places aboard the boat. During the summer, temperatures in the boiler room could soar to 135 degrees. The officers in charge specialized in the efficient operation of the engines, but those who stoked the firebox were likely some of the least skilled members of the crew. So we'll head back out.